Good day, folks. Good to be here with you again as we uh, continue in our verse by verse uh, study of First Peter. I hope uh, your week has been blessed of God. I pray and hope that uh, you are well and um, uh, so that uh, also very thankful that uh, over these uh, number of years, four or five years, I've been doing this on, uh, with these videos, that you've uh, taken the time to at least listen to them. I, I pray that God has blessed you through these things as well. So please turn your Bibles to First Peter chapter 3. We are actually, imagine this, wrapping up chapter 3 after a number of weeks in this particular chapter. So let me offer you a definition. Dictionary.com defines self-esteem as a realistic respect or favorable impression of oneself. On the negative side of the house, uh, self-esteem is an inordinately or exaggeratedly favorable uh, Favorable impression of oneself. I almost got myself lost. An ordin inordinately or exaggeratedly favorable impression of oneself. You can put it in a sentence like this. His, him or her uh, self-esteem can sometimes be very annoying. Can I ask you this question then? Do you struggle with self-esteem? And I just want to share a few quotes that I found uh, online that I suppose were intended to boost someone's self-esteem. I'm not sure if that's actually what they will do or if that even works, but let me share these with you. Here's the first one. Quote, the moment that you start to wonder if you deserve better, you do. Here comes one I think is, uh, I don't like it, but I'm going to share it anyways, just to give you an idea. Quote, we are all, we are all of us stars and we deserve to shine. How about this one? Tear off the mask, your face is glorious. I don't know. Not sure I like any of those. But anyways, that's not, not neither here nor there. How about we add a little God into the mix? Here's a quote from one of, the, one of an influential and popular evangelical pastor of our day here in North America, who said, quote, Today is a new day, so rise up and move forward into the victory God has prepared for you. I know, and you know, that self-esteem is part of what makes us human, human beings. And sometimes life beats us down and we struggle. And sometimes as human beings, we run in all cylinders. And I hope you notice, though, despite all that, that, one, that the one thing these quotes have in common is it's about positive thinking. And the object or the subject, I mean, of this positive think thinking is self. The subject is you and me. And let's be more specific, it's our human nature. So along this same, this same theme, I came across an article by one Robbie Castleman. And in his article, he picks up on our theme of self-esteem and ties this into how some Christians understand their salvation. And Robbie writes that some Christians summarize salvation in this way. Jesus saved me from my sins. Now, uh, on the surface, this sounds okay. Right? Robbie writes more. And he, he says, after those that summarize their salvation as Jesus saving me from my sins, some would even uh, present or provide a list of things that they had done wrong that Jesus saved them from. And I think Robbie rightly identifies this understanding of our salvation as anemic. I would just say it's very weak. Because this view of salvation in oneself, self-appraisal, compares our sins against the really bad sins that other people commit. Those really bad people, you know, on the news and social media. And that's exactly Robbie's point. He said, quote, well, that's the problem. We can't imagine ourselves as bad as those people on the news. And of course, this kind of thinking discounts the biblical record. Sin is not, as Robbie highlight, is not, as Robbie highlights, a list of bad behaviors. The problem is, folks, our sinful nature. And that's who we are. 
And when you and I reduce our salvation to a list of sins to manage, Jesus is one of many steps that Rob, Robbie describes in his article as self-esteem therapy. And there goes the grace of God in Christ. It becomes nothing but a prescription to have our best life now. So then we're left with a question again, who are we? Well, Robbie will answer that for himself. He said this, quote, we are awful sinners saved by an awesome Savior. We need to be sinners who don't pretend we aren't capable of the worst. We are the least of saints being brought to perfection in the day of Jesus Christ. Well, folks, now we're in 1 Peter chapter 3, and we'll just read uh, together verse um, 18 through to 22. Verse 18 through to 22. Verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers, having been subjected to him. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Dear Father, we thank you for your word. As we unpack these verses, as we try to summarize and bring things together at the end of this chapter, would you help us by your spirit not only to understand in our minds, but to uh, work it deep into our spirits, into our hearts. And we thank you, Lord, for this time to uh, uh, honor you in this way by studying your word and listening to your message. I thank you for it, Lord. We all thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So, friends, we pick up today where we left off last week, beginning here at verse 18. And verse 18 continues the Apostle Peter's uh, thought process that we, we started looking at at verse 8 down to our text today. Now, we've gone over this at least three or four times. Two primary themes uh, continue through the end of chapter 3. One is suffering for one's faith in Christ. And the secondary is the essential unity of a believer facing their various trials. The believer is facing their various trials. So let's read verse 18 together once more. Verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Now, friends, this, uh, this verse should have a familiar ring to it. We go back to chapter 2 of Peter's letter, and there we find the apostle encouraged the first believers who were slaves. And he said to them, Be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. That's back in chapter 2, verse 18. You see, the apostle would be very aware that the life of a slave, and in this case a Christian slave, could be very miserable indeed. Even so, he went on and continued to say this in the next verse, in chapter 2, verse 19, Peter said, But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Now, certainly, our 21st century sensibilities are being challenged when we read stuff like this, when we consider Peter's statement here, because this is not good stuff here. It's not, it's not good at all. But this don't allow our sensibilities to distract us because we can miss something important in this text. Let me roughly paraphrase just to begin with here what the apostle is saying. To, roughly, and probably not very well, what the apostle is saying here is, if you are persecuted for doing good, think of Christ. If you are persecuted for doing good, think of Christ. See, the Apostle Peter had already established early in his letter that his audience had been what? Been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That was in chapter 1, verse 3. A living hope that included what? An inheritance. An inheritance that was kept in heaven. Until, and until Jesus returned in the last time 
The one who places their faith in Christ will be guarded by God's power. In other words, my friends, no circumstance, no situation, uh, no matter what it was, uh, would take their salvation away. Their salvation was assured. And when Jesus returns, their salvation would be, as he said in chapter 1, verse 5, fully revealed. It will come to consummation. Now I want to ask you another question. Or ask you a question, not another question. Would you describe yourself as a happy person overall? Or might you describe yourself as a joyful person overall? And did you know, biblically speaking, that there is a difference between being happy and joyful? Now, one pastor, Jim Johnson, from Tulsa, Oklahoma, would say that, quote, joy is one of the vital gauges on the dashboard of the Christian life. When the needle dips, Pastor uh, Jim would say, when the needle dips, when you lose your joy, you should take note. And he goes on to say this, quote, Joy is the emotion of salvation. It is the joy of seeing and knowing and loving and trusting Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say we cannot generate this true joy ourselves. And the, and the, and the biblical record testifies to what P Pastor Jim said here. Because Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, said that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. What is this joy? It's what Nehemiah said to the people after Ezra the priest read the law of God after years of exile. He said to them, do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. You find that in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. With this joy in mind, the Apostle Peter said in chapter 1, verse 6, In this you rejoice. And rejoice what? Though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. You see, joy, my friends, in the Lord is not dependent on our circumstances or situations. Joy in the Lord is not a feeling. Uh, feeling. It's not a feeling good or being happy. And certainly, joy in the Lord is not positive thinking. Joy is what Jesus said to his disciples a few hours before his death. He said to his disciples, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be, may be with you and that your joy may be full. June, uh, June. <laughs> sorry guys, it's been a long day. John 15, 11. And friends, this joy will not be extinguished, stamped out, if you will, by our circumstances, our situations. This joy will sustain the believer in life and certainly in persecution. And this joy will, light, will be the light onto the believer's path in the darkest of hours or the darkest of nights. In the next chapter of John, John 16, Jesus said to his disciples, no one will take your joy from you. Let's go back to our text and let's take a closer look at this verse 18. Now, we've already stated that a believer's joy is the result of placing their trust in Jesus Christ. It is a work of the Spirit of Christ in the life of a believer. It's not something we can generate and concoct ourselves. And if a time comes when a believer is persecuted for doing good, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Apostle Peter said here, one verse up from our verse 18, verse 17, and the first part of verse 18 here, Peter said, For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered. Remember what he had said, what we had, what we had said earlier in chapter 2, verse 19. Peter said, When you do good and suffer for it, you endure that for it you endure, this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. And here at verse 17, the apostle adds, it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will. Well, friends, if it is God's will that believers should suffer for doing good, it was God's will for sure for Christ to suffer for doing good. The question is then, what good work did Christ do that he would suffer for? Let's read on in verse 18. For he suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Apostle Peter here in this text describes 
a number of things. First of all, he describes the true nature, the true nature of mankind, their human nature, our human nature, your human nature, my human nature, with one word, unrighteous. And that a holy and just and loving God sent his one and only righteous son, Jesus Christ, to suffer for the sin of the world, to suffer for your sin and my sin. Jesus Christ accomplished this good work by submitting to the will of the Father, and here in verse 18, by submitting to the will of the Father and being put to death in the flesh once for sins. We go to the Apostle Paul in his Roman letter, chapter 6. Uh, there he describes Jesus' good work in this way. Chapter 6, verse 10, Paul said, For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. We can ask why. Why did Jesus endure these insults, the hatred, the false allegations, the beating, the brutal Roman cross? Well, here in 18, verse 18 of Peter's letter, that he might bring us to God, that he might deliver us to God. Apostle Paul, back in Apostle Paul, again, Roman letter, chapter 5 now, verse 18, he said that Christ's one act of Righteousness, that is, his life, death, and resurrection, led to justification and life for all of mankind, all of men. You see, my friends, the believer, you and me, have been justified by Christ's act of righteousness and thus have been united to Christ. And this brings us to chapter 6 of Romans. And if you want to go there, please go there, because all the stuff I'm going to say in the next few minutes is, all the things I'm going to be saying, pardon me, for the next few minutes is from Romans 6, 1 to 11. And that particular text, we find the Apostle Paul's theological explanation concerning the ordinance of baptism, which the Apostle Peter makes a reference to here in our text in verse 21. And we'll go there in verse 21 momentarily, but back to Paul and in Romans. So, the question is, how are believers united to Christ? Well, via Christ's death and resurrection. And our baptism is a visible reminder of this. The Apostle Paul explains. Uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 3, Paul said, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death? And then he would go on to say that we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Let's put this in plain language. Friends, going into the water of baptism is described as dying to self. Paul's analogy is clear. As Jesus was buried after he died, a believer goes down into the water of baptism and, and dies to self. See, a believer's sin nature is buried with Christ in order that, Paul would say in verse 4 of chapter 6, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And he goes on even more in verse 6 of Romans 6 and says, Therefore our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. That's Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Remember Robbie's uh, contention with some believers? Believers with a weak view of salvation who provide their tidy list of sins and then compare themselves to those really, really bad people around them? Friends, here Romans 6 and the Apostle Paul does away with this kind of weak view of salvation. Jesus didn't endure mockery and beatings and death on the cross for some subject subjective list of bad behaviors. Paul has told us he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also, believer, you, believer, must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Well, friends, we've come now to uh, verse 19 through to 22. Let's read that again to remind ourselves, refresh ourselves. Verse 19 to 22. We read in verse 19, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in the prison, in prison, because they reformly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 22, 
who has gone into heaven and is the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers, uh, having been subjected to him. I'm all... Um, this particular set of texts, this verses, especially verse 19 and 21, uh, we are challenged on how to interpret what the Apostle Peter is writing here, was writing here. Now, there's been another of alternative interpre interpretations given. I found at least five uh, that can, five ways one can interpret verse 19 to 21. And of course, I'm always up to the challenge, but today is not the place to go into a study of the different uh, interpretations of the Apostle's letter. So let's do this, okay, folks? Let's do this. Let's keep it simple and apply some of the best practices of biblical study and interpretation. First, first rule. Let's apply that. Context, context, context. And one more rule, the second rule, is to ask the question, are these verses prescriptive or descriptive? So first, the context. And this is what we know. Over and over in this letter, Apostle Peter was encouraging and guiding his audience in their trials and persecutions for their faith in Christ. And part and parcel, like two peas in a pod, uh, of a believer's persecution is because Christ also suffered. Verse 18, that's what Paul, Peter said. This means, friends, that our good works, whether it is God's will uh, to suffer, for us to suffer for them or not, are a result of Christ who died for our sins. You see, without Christ dying for all of our sins, all our good works are accomplished for our own selfish reasons. Isaiah would put it this way in his Isaiah the prophet said, we have all become like one who's unclean. All of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. Some, tra some translations use uh, um, filthy rags. All our deeds are like filthy rags. So the next question we need to ask ourselves, are these verses prescriptive or descriptive? We could say it this way. Was the apostle giving his audience a command like, like God gave to Israel through Moses? You know, when he said, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not steal, etc., etc. Exodus chapter 20, uh, verse 3 and following. Or was the apostle describing something? And I think it would be obvious if we read through this text, as we just did, the apostle was describing something in this text. One commentator put it this way, he was describing this. Quote, Jesus in his post-resurrection state went somewhere and preached something to certain spirits in some prison. Now this brings up another question, why? Why did the apostle Peter point to Noah and baptism? Well, the apostle in these verses was developing an analogy. And if you forgot what an analogy is, it's a comparison of two things for the purpose of explanation or clarification. So now we have another question we can ask. What was the apostle trying to explain, trying to clarify? Remember, keep the context in the forefront of your mind. The apostle here was using an analogy between Noah's deliverance from the Genesis flood and the Christian experience of today. A believer is carried through the waters of the coming divine judgment, coming judgment of Christ by their union, their baptism, if you will, into Christ. And as Noah, when the flood subsided, was placed into a purified new world, believers in Christ are taken out of the moral world today, where people live, as for the apostles, as the apostles said here in chapter 4, verse 2, which we'll look at next week, for human passions, human desires. Believers, my friends, have been delivered into a new spiritual and moral creation, where they live to do what? What the apostle Paul reminded the Ephesians to do the good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Well, friends, we've covered plenty of territory plenty of territory since we began to unpack chapter 3 uh, of Peter's letter here weeks ago. We've been at this for a while. And when we think of the apostles' audience facing increasing resistance and persecution so long ago, we can take the apostles' encouragement and the Holy Spirit-inspired guidance that he was given and look around at our context and see a growing hatred for Christ and his church. We see this from without, from without the church and even from within. 
And the apostle has reminded his audience, as he reminds us, that we shouldn't be surprised that believers are looked down upon and mocked, insulted, and hated, and called all sorts of names. The apostle was simply passing on what our Lord and Savior has said to him. And to paraphrase, to paraphrase Jesus very poorly, he said, If they hate me, they will hate you. If they persecute me, they will persecute you. The apostle would soon face the greatest challenge of all in his life, his own crucifixion at the hand of the Romans. And maybe, if it is God's will, you and I will one day face the executioner ourselves, barring Jesus' return. And as we look at verse 21, it is fitting that the Apostle Peter reminded his audience and us today that Jesus Christ is now at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. The enemy of our souls, the devil and his demons, and the world may think that they have the upper hand today, but they are blind, they are self-deceived, for a day will come, as Paul reminds his, uh, the Philippian church and reminds us today, a day will come that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this message. We thank you, Lord, that even in the midst of our own struggles, whether they're health struggles, relationship struggle, financial, and even if it is your will to be persecuted, and we are, maybe in this part of the world, not like other parts of the world, from time to time persecuted for our faith in Christ. And we ask you, Lord, to remind us of what Peter has reminded his audience so long ago. Lord, that uh, our salvation is assured no matter what. Whatever we go through, our circumstances are not, uh, are not, to, uh, are not going to affect the joy we have in Christ, that one day all will be made right, all will be set right. And we thank you for that. And I pray for my friends. I pray, God, to bless them. You would bless them and keep them and watch over them. And we praise you and thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good day. Shalom.